Coquetry by Alfred de Musset. Translated from the French by George Murray. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. O oh, women, fated to beguile, your spells we all confess. Ye can elate us with a smile, or with a frown depress. Two words, a scornful glance, or in the silence that ignores, Can stab as with a dagger keen the fool who still adores. And, thanks to man, that craven hound, your plaything and your prey, Naught but your frailty can be found to match your boundless sway. But when the lust of power has grown too rank, that power must die, and thus your slaves at length disown their thraldom with a sigh. Their fate, though pitiful to see, is still more blessed than yours. You torture, I would sooner be the victim that endures. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Song by Victor Hugo, translated from the French by George Murray, read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Song My songs, poor ephemeral things, would fly to thy garden so fair, if they had but the tremulous wings that speed the light bird through the air. Like fire sparks that gaily upspring, they would fly to thy welcoming hearth, if they had but the venturesome wing that lifts thought afar from the earth. Night and day they would faithfully bring sweet messages dearest to thee, if they had but love's butterfly wing to waft them over land and over sea. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Gentleman Cricketer's Team by George Murray. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. The Gentleman Cricketer's Team, respectfully dedicated to its subject. I've a toast to propose you, so gentlemen, hand on, the mum and the clicquot, the mouette and chandon. The toast that I offer with pleasure extreme is the health of the Gentleman Cricketer's Team. And first, here's the health of their captain, Fitzgerald, whose time-honoured name stands in need of no herald. All know that he manages matches as well as a matchmaking mother with daughters to sell. Next, here's to the chief of the ball-driving race, a giant in cricket as well as a grace. Bat, bowler or field, in himself he's a host, all round the best player that Britain can boast. Here's to Hornby, who bears the cognomen of monkey, all muscle and nerve, never feeble or funky, for pluck, skill and strength, he is hard to be beaten by picked men from Winchester, Harrow, or Eton. Here's the left-handed bowler that Lancashire as well, whom Ottawa batsman remembers so well. He bowled the whole innings and bowled like great guns in apple pie order for only three runs. And here's to his confrere, spectacular Rose, a rather quick bowler of dangerous slows. And now to the Lubbox, a brave pair of brothers who rank with the Graces, the Walkers, and others. Next, here's to four stars of the Oxford Eleven, with all due respect for the home-keeping seven. Here's to Harris and Ottaway, Francis and Haddo, may time never decrease his Herculean shadow. Here's to Pickering, lastly, his name is enough to prove that he's made of good cricketing stuff. Warm welcome, I'm sure, he will ever be shown for the sake of his uncle as well as his own. So here's to them singly or taken together, a finer set never yet hunted the leather. Once more then I pledge you, with pleasure extreme, the health of the gentleman cricketer's team. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Flowers from the Greek Anthology by Diverse Authors Translated from the Greek by George Murray Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia Flowers from the Greek Anthology Men were deceivers ever By Callimachus To fair Ione, Callignotus swore None but herself to cherish or adore 
But men say truly that the gods above Laugh at the reckless perjuries of love. See, the false boy to other lips has flown, While fond Ione waits and weeps alone. The Clinging Vine by Antipater of Sidon A vine over me, a withered plain, hath grown, And shrouds my limbs with foliage not their own, Grateful, because my boughs once verdant trained, Her tender shoots, her clustering grapes sustained. So choose, fond boy, a partner like the vine, Whose love around thee, even in death, may twine. On a Physician by Nicarchus. Ten of Alexis' patients once were ill. To three a draught, to two he gave a pill, and five he blistered. Well, what followed then? One night, one grave, one Hades for the ten. The Mirror of Lace by Plato. I, Lace, once of Hellas the delight, to Venus consecrate my mirror bright. What I am now, I do not care to see. What I was once, I never again can be. A Dead Child by Lucianus Five years alone had vanished since my birth, When ruthless Pluto snatched me from the earth. Mourn not my fate, for if my life was brief, I learned but little of life's sins and grief. Xerxes and Leonidas by Philippus Thessalonicensis Ere brave Leonidas had breathed his last, A purple cloak around him Xerxes cast. The warrior cried, Thine honours I reject, Stretched on my shield, my course is amply decked. No Persian I, to Hades I will go, Sparta's true son, in life and death, thy foe. Thou art not dead, but thou hast sought a calmer place of rest. Sweet Prote, thou art blooming in the islands of the blest, And dances over Elysian plains in quiet holy mirth, Culling soft flowerets, far away from all the woes of earth. Thou dost not faint with summer heat, nor shrink beneath the storm. No thirst, no hunger, no disease can mar thy gentle form. For mortal life thou dost not sigh, enshrined in cloudless light. Thou wanderest by the heavenly hill, a virgin, pure and bright. Inscription on a Tomb, Author Unknown I seek, Sabinus, by this little stone, Great love for thee, departed friend, to own. My love will last, thy love for me to show, Drink not of Lethe in the realms below. On Venus Arising from the Sea By Antipater of Sidon Charmed by Apelles' magic, here thine eyes May view sweet Venus from the waves arise. Twined in her hair, her glowing fingers press The dews of ocean from each dripping tress. So fair that Juno's self and Pallas sigh, With thee twere vain in loveliness to vie. The Shrine of Venus by Antipater of Sidon Small is the chapel where I make my home, Queen of these shores all white with ocean foam. But still tis dear, my presence calms the waves, And oft the mariner from shipwreck saves. Pay court to Venus, she will succour thee In love's wild storms or on the raging sea. The Shrine of Venus by Anite Fair Aphrodite, from this marble fane Delights to gaze upon the glassy main, Smoothing the sailor's pathway, while the deep beholds her image and is lulled asleep. Discontented, author unknown. Poor when a boy, but opulent when old, twice have I suffered misery untold. Wealth when I could have used it, I had none. I have it now, when life is nearly done. A Lover's Prayer by Polemon Sweet Cupid, kill my power to love, unless I'm loved again. Thus, free from passion, I shall prove, or share the blissful pain. A Lament by Callimachus The gentle maids of Samos' isle miss their sweet fellow weaver's smile, for Croesus oft with prattle gay would while the hours of toil away. But now she sleeps beyond recall, the sleep that must be slept by all. 
on the statue of a Bacanti, author unknown. Restrain that Bacanti, ere the marble maid leaps from the shrine and seeks the forest glade. On the Picture of Venus by Apelles, by Julian of Egypt. Stand back while Venus quits her ocean home, or her wet locks will sprinkle thee with foam. Love and Wine by Rufinus Love by himself I can defy, with reason for my shield. When Bacchus fights as love's ally, to two such gods I yield. The Zone of Venus by Antiphonus of Macedonia when Venus loosed the cestus of desire from her white breast, the love-compelling zone was lent thee, I know, all mankind to fire. But thou hast used it against me alone. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Student's Wife by Victor Hugo Translated from the French by George Murray. Read for LibriVox.org by Sandra Schmidt. The Student's Wife from Les Contemplations of Victor Hugo. She said, It is true, love, how foolish my sighs. It is true that the hours pass enchantingly so. You are here, and I gaze unreproved on your eyes, where I trace all your thoughts as they come and they go. To see you is bliss, bliss to me incomplete. Don't fancy I murmur at all at my lot. I watch that naught irksome invades your retreat, for I know what you love, dear, and what you do not. In a corner I nestle most wondrously small, for you are my lion and I am your dove. I pick up your pens should they happen to fall, and the soft rustling sound of your papers I love. No doubt I possess you. I see you, no doubt. Still, Thought is a wine with which dreamers get drunk. You should dream but of me. I have reason to pout when each eve in old books your whole being is sunk. There's a shade in my loving heart's inmost recess when you never raise your head, never speak, never smile. And I never can see you completely unless you look at me sometimes yourself for a while. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Song by Alfred du Musset, translated from the French by George Murray, read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. I said to my heart, to my restless heart, love one, one only, nor seek to part. The love that wanders from flower to flower wastes in stray fancies each blissful hour. But my heart replied, for my paradise, Eve's self. Eve only would scarce suffice To change one's love with the changing year But makes the joys of the past more dear. I said to my heart, to my wayward heart, What charm can lie in each varied smart? The love that ever delights to range But finds fresh sorrow in each fresh change. But my heart replied to me, Manhood scorns to pluck sweet roses devoid of thorns, To change one's love with the changing year, but makes the pains of the past more dear. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Toilet of Constance by George Murray Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia The Toilet of Constance From the Ballad of Casimir de la Vigne As abbreviated by Ruskin In Volume 3 of his Modern Painters Haste, Anna! Did you hear me call? My mirror, quick! The hours advance! Tonight I'm going to the ball at the ambassadors of France. Just think, those bows were fresh and fair last eve. Ah, beauty fades apace. See, from the net that binds my hair, the azure tassels droop with grace. Your hands are awkward, girl, tonight. These sapphires well become my brow. A pin has pricked me. Set it right. Dear Anna, I look charming now. He whom my fancy has beguiled, Anna, my robe, will be a guest. Fie, fie, that's not my necklace, child. Those beads the Holy Father blessed. 
oh should his hand my fingers press at the mere thought i tremble dear to-morrow should i dare confess the truth in pere anselmo's ear give me my gloves now all is well in the tall glass one final glance to-night i long to be the belle at the ambassadors of france close to the hearth she stood and gazed o oh god a spark ignites her dress fire help when every hope was raised how sad such death for loveliness the flame voluptuously gnaws her arms her breast around above and swallows with unpitying jaws her eighteen years her dreams of love farewell to all youth's visions gay they only said ah poor constance and waltzed until the dawn of day at the ambassadors of france end of poem this recording is in the public domain Le Monde est Méchant by Théophile Gautier Translated from the French by George Murray Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter The world is malevolent, dear, And it says with a cynical sneer That your bosom conceals, ma petite, A watch where a heart ought to beat. Still your breast, when emotion enthralls, Like a wave ever rises and falls, with the ebb and the flow of the tide that o'er your young body doth glide the world has maliciously said that your eyes full of passion are dead and revolve in their orbits on springs like patent mechanical things still oft-times a crystalline tear on your eyelashes trembles my dear like a pearl drop of luminous dew that clings to some violet blue the world is malicious. It swears that your brain is as light as a hare's, and that sonnets composed for your ear are riddles in Greek to you, dear. Still, oft on your lips that unclose like the leaves of an exquisite rose, a subtle, intelligent smile alights like a bee for a while. Tis because you are fond of me, dear, that the world in your case is severe. Discard me. And then they will say, What feeling and wit you display! End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Ballad of Jean Renaud by George Murray. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. The Ballad of Jean Renaud. This popular song of Valois may be found at page 158 of Les Filles du Feu by Gérard de Nerval, and also at page 77 of the same writer's La Bohème Galante. It begins as follows. Quand Jean Renaud de la guerre revint, il en revint triste et chagrin. Bonjour, ma mère. Bonjour, mon fils. Ta femme est accouchée d'un petit, etc. Back from the war came Jean Renaud, his face was dark with a secret woe. Good day, my mother. Good day, my son. Thy wife hath borne thee a little one. Go in, my mother, go in, he said. Bid them prepare me a fair white bed. And let them silently serve my need, so that my wife may pay no heed. When midnight's hour was drawing nigh, Jean Renaud breathed his latest sigh. Ici, in the words of Nerval, la scène de la ballade change et se transporte dans la chambre de la coucher. Prithee, tell me, my mother dear, what is the wailing that now I hear? It is the bairns in the room beneath, they cry because of their aching teeth. But prithee, tell me, my mother dear, what knocking and nailing now I hear? It is the carpenter, nothing more, busily mending a plank in the floor. But prithee tell me, my mother dear, what is the singing that now I hear? Tis some procession, my child, I wot, that chants while passing around our cot. But prithee tell me, my mother dear, why from thine eyelid there drops a tear? Alas, the truth I no more can hide, Jean Renaud in this house hath died. My mother, haste to the sexton old, 
let him dig a grave for two in the mould and let the pit be wide and deep my baby also therein shall sleep end of poem this recording is in the public domain the cid and the jew by theophile gautier translated from the french by george murray read for LibriVox.org by sandra schmidt the cid and the jew translated from theophile gautier the cid stern victor in each fight hero of more than mortal height in the grand church of san pedro twas don alfonso willed it so embalmed and seemingly not dead clad in bright steel and helmeted sits rooted to a stately chair raised on a tomb of sculpture rare like a white cloth his beard of snow his coat of mail doth overflow while to defend him at his side hangs tisona his boast and pride the polished and elastic blade that moor and christian oft dismayed thus seated dead he seems to keep the semblance of a man asleep thus for seven years he hath reposed since death his life of daring closed and on a certain day each year crowds gaze upon his corpse in fear once when all visitors had gone and the great cid was left alone in the broad nave with god a jew nigh to the sleeping champion drew and thus he spake here sits the frame of one whom men still dread to name tis said the strongest warriors feared even to touch his grizzled beard here now he rests mute and cold his arms which scattered foe of old hang stiffened by the hand of death lo since he hath no longer breath myself will stroke his beard of snow i wot the mummy will not know and none are present to forbid my laying hands upon the cid with no presentiment of harm the sordid jew outstretched his arm but ere that snowy beard could be soiled by his mad impiety the cid from out his scabbard drew three feet of steel that dazed the view scared by the ghastly miracle prone on the tomb the hebrew fell and when good monks at close of day had borne his palsied limbs away he told them his adventure strange and vowed a graceless life to change soon he abjured his faith and then entered the convent's gloom amen end of poem this recording is in the public domain welcome to mark twain by louis honore frechette translated from the french by george murray read for librivox dot org by thomas peter come sing my muse our honoured guest before the toasts are started of all philosophers the best because the lightest hearted he well deserves a golden rhyme to-night and oft hereafter who roused while laughing at his time its sympathetic laughter life's dearest charm in laughter lies and if this creed were common the universe would scarce comprise a sulky man or woman to laugh is man's divinest art and loud or gaily chaffing the truest echo from the heart of either sex is laughing let us then banish from our feast all thoughts of melancholy and glorify the quaint high priest of fancy fun and folly thy health mark twain of wits like thee i would there were a few more to temper subtle french esprit with fine old english humour end of poem this recording is in the public domain lord roberts by george murray read for librivox dot org by thomas peter he came he saw he conquered though his heart bled for his only son in battle slain god's pity aided him to play his part and gave him glory to console his pain tears we accord him in his grief cheers for each triumph won england will ne'er forget her chief who sorrows for his son dense clouds of darkness overcast the sky when sad but stern the gray-haired warrior came scathed the rude foe like lightning from on high 
and blotted out the old Majuba's shame. Great God of hosts, protect our champion's life. Save him, O Lord, fresh laurels still to glean, and keep the memory of his valor green. Crown him as victor in the deadly strife, the idol of his country and his queen. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Streamlet by Théophile Gautier Translated from the French by George Murray Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia The Streamlet A thread-like stream that had its source In lonely haunts beside a lake Exultingly began its course Resolved far pilgrimage to make Softly it murmured, What delight! Forth from the underworld I leap, And in my wavelets mirror bright The golden clouds reflected sleep. The blue-eyed Myosotis sighs, Forget me not when far away, And sunlit wings of dragonflies Upon my dimpled surface play. The wild birds from my crystal sip, And when my stream hath onward rolled, A few short years perchance twill lip, Green vales and rocks and castles old. The foaming of my restless tide Shall fringe stone bridge and granite key, While steamships on my bosom ride Down to the everlasting sea. The newborn rill, with prattling glee, Dared the dim future thus to paint, And, like some geyser, strove to free Her eager waters from restraint. But oft the giant dies a child, the cradle borders on the tomb, and thus the stream that lately smiled died in the lake's engulfing gloom. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Eagle and the Kings by Victor Hugo, translated from the French by George Murray, read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. The Eagle and the Kings From Victor Hugo An eagle sought the desert spring Beside a lion's cave. Meanwhile, two kings, God willed it so, Espied the sparkling wave. Beneath tall palms, Where pilgrims quenched their drought, Fresh strength to gain, These kings, sworn foemen, Fought their duel out, Till both were slain. The eagle hovered Over each lifeless brow, and mocking said, Ye found the universe too small, And now your souls have fled. O princes lately jubilant, Your bones to-morrow must be mixed With indistinguishable stones amid the dust. Ye fools, what gained ye by your savage feud? Behold, the end. I, the proud eagle, haunt this solitude, The lion's friend. From the same spring we drink, each morn and eve, Kings, he and I, Hill, dale and forest depth to him I leave, And keep the sky. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Pilgrimage to Kevlar by Heinrich Heine Translated from the German by George Murray Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. 1. The mother stood at her lattice. The son lay on his bed. Come, gaze at the holy pilgrims, Wilhelm. Arise, she said. I am so ill, my mother. I scarce can see or hear. On my dead Margaret musing, my heart, alas, is drear. Arise, we will go to Kevlar. The book and rosary take. The mother of God will heal thee. Thy poor heart must not break. The pilgrims wave church banners and chant in a solemn tone, and so the procession passes through the Rhenish town, Cologne. In the crowd the mother follows, she leads her son, and he joins with her in the chanting, Blessed be thou, Marie. 2. The mother of God at Kevlar is dazzlingly arrayed. Today she is busy healing the sick who have sought her aid. They lay their many offerings before her shrine in prayer, limbs, feet, and hands all modelled in waxwork clean and fair. And whoso a wax hand offers is cured, if his hand is maimed, while he who a wax foot bringeth is healed, though his foot is lamed. 
but the mother took a taper and fashioned thereof a heart. Take that to the Holy Virgin, and she will ease thy smart. The son knelt down to the Virgin, and offered the heart with sighs. A prayer broke forth from his spirit, and tears broke forth from his eyes. O Virgin, Queen of Heaven, thou pure and holy maid, to thee I breathe my sorrows, for thou my woe canst aid. I dwelt with my tender mother in the Rhenish town Cologne, that many hundred churches and chapels there doth own. And near us dwelt my Margaret, but dead she lieth now. A waxen heart I bring thee, my wounded heart heal thou. Heal thou my heart that is broken, and, singing fervently, I will pray both late and early. Blessed be thou, Marie. Three. The sick son and his mother slept in a lowly room, when, lo, the virgin lightly stepped inwards through the gloom. She bent above the sick man, and on his heart did lay her gentle fingers softly, and smiled and went away. The mother saw in a vision what happened in the dark, and wakened from her slumber, for the dogs did loudly bark. Her son lay stretched before her, and the light of morning red fell on his cold, pale features. The breath of life had fled. Then her hands the mother folded, she felt she scarce knew how, and she whispered low, devoutly, O oh Mary, blessed be thou! End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Leaf by Vincent Antoine Arnaud. Translated from the French by George Murray. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. The Leaf, Vincent Antoine Arnaud, 1815. Severed from thy native bough, whither art thou wandering now, poor sear leaf? I do not know. When the oak, alas, too frail, crashed beneath the tempest's blow, I was borne by breeze or gale, fluttering through the sun and rain, and at random still I sail from the mountain to the vale, from the forest to the plain. Murmuring now no timid wail, With the wind I drift away, Whither all that's earthly goes, Where the leaflet of the rose Moulders with the leaf of bay. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. My Neighbor's Curtain by Elfrey du Musset Translated from the French by George Murray Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter My charming neighbor's curtain is moving, I declare. She's coming, I feel certain, to woo the evening air. She wishes to discover, oh, how my heart doth beat, if I, her well-dressed lover, am watching in the street. Alas, I am mistaken. She loves a country lout, and if her curtain's shaken, Tis by the wind, no doubt. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Strike of the Smiths by Francois Copy, translated from the French by George Murray. Read for LibriVox.org by Sandra Schmidt. The Strike of the Smiths, translated from the French of Francois Copy. Monsieur le Juge, my story shall be brief. Tis this. The foundrymen were out on strike. It was their right. The winter had been hard, and men were tired of keeping endless land. One Saturday, the evening of our pay, some comrades led me gently by the arm into a wine shop. There my oldest mates, I still refuse to give the court their names, spoke thus. Père Jean, it seems we have no pluck. We want more wages, or we work no more. They grind us down, it is our last resource. We choose you, therefore, as the oldest hand, to warn the master, but with no big words, that if our pay henceforward be not raised, each day will be sint Monday at the works. Père Jean, are you our man? I answered, yes. If I can serve you in your need, I will. I am no communist, mon président, but an old, peaceful man, with no great faith in the spruce black coats that control a strike. Still, it may be I could not well refuse. So, pledged to act, I sought the master's house and found him dining. 
Having made my bow, I told him squarely how we all were pinched by cost of food and lodging, and I showed things could not last so. Then I figured out his gains and ours, and proved with due respect it could not ruin him to raise our pay. He listened calmly, while he cracked some nuts, and said at last, Père Jean, I see you are an honest man, and they who chose you knew what they were doing when they sent you here. For you there always shall be work and pay, but their demands would cripple me at once. I close the works tomorrow. All who join in lawless strikes are good for nothing drones. Tis my last word, and you can tell them so. I answered, It is well, sir, and withdrew, with heavy heart, and carried to my mates the master's answer, as I promised him. Wild tumult followed, anarchy, revolt. Then, with one voice, they pledged themselves to strike. And I too, like my fellows, took the oath. Oh, more than one that evening, as he flung on a bare table all his scanty hire, felt, I will warrant, anything but gay, and failed to close his eyelids when he thought that, since his wages ended with his work, he soon must learn the lesson how to fast. For me the blow was crushing. I am old, and not alone. That night, on reaching home, I took my little grandsons on my knees, my daughter died in childbirth, and her man went to the dogs. I looked upon the two small mouths that soon must hunger, and I blushed for having rashly sworn to join the strike. Still, I was not worse stranded than the rest, and as we workmen scorned to break an oath, I vowed to do my duty by the craft. My poor old wife now entered. She was bowed beneath a bale of linen newly washed, and when with faltering tongue I broke the news, Poor thing, she had not heart enough to scold, but stood long time in silence, with her eyes fixed on the floor. At length she said, My man, thou knowest that I am thrifty, and will do all that a woman can, but times are hard, and we have bread for barely two weeks more. I answered, Things will soon come right again, though well I knew that, short of playing false, I could do nothing and that those on strike, sworn to maintain it to the bitter end, would make short work of men who sold the cause. Soon came our troubles. Oh, mes juges, mes juges, you may believe that when our cup of woes was full, I never could become a thief, but must have died of horror at the thought. Nor do I claim one jot of praise is due, even to the hopeless wretch who, morn and eve, is forced to stare disaster in the face, for never harbouring a guilty thought. Still, when the winter pierced us to the bone with icy fangs, and when my honest gaze dwelt on those living challenges to sin, my hungry grandsons and heroic wife, and watched them, shivering by a fireless grate, despite those wailing babes and careworn wife, despite that terrible and freezing group, never, I swear by Christ the Crucified, even for a moment, did my clouded brain conceive the thought of theft, that shameless act, when the eye watches and the fingers clutch. Alas, if now my pride is broken down, if now I bend before you, if I weep, tis that I see again the three of whom I spake, for whom I did what I have done. At first we lived as we were forced to live. We ate dry bread and pawned our little all. I suffered much. To men like us a room seems a barred cage from which we long to flee. Look you, since then, I've had a taste of jail, and truth to tell, I've found them much alike. But to do nothing is a hell on earth. Let those that doubt it have their arms tied down by strong necessity. They soon will learn why men must work, and why the atmosphere of file and fire is what mechanics love. Two weeks had passed, and not a sou was left. Meanwhile, I walked, like one whose brain is crazed, alone mid crowds straight onwards. For the roar of a big city seems to silence thought, and deadens hunger better far than wine. But once on reaching home, it was at the close of a dull, raw December afternoon, I found my helpmate crouching on the floor with the two babies strained against her breast. And while I thought, "'Tis I am murdering them," she meekly spake like one confused with shame. "'My poor dear man!' The pawn shop has refused this worn-out mattress, all we have on earth. 
and now I know not where to look for bread. Wait, I replied, and brought at last to bay, vowed at all hazards to go back to work. Then, though mistrustful of my welcome there, I sought the wine shop, a repulsive haunt that harboured all the leaders of the strike. I raised the latch. Methought it was a dream. While others starved, those men were drinking hard. Yes, drinking. May the board that paid the wine and thus prolonged our hideous martyrdom hear the loud curses of an old man's tongue. I faced the topers, and when once they marked my frowning forehead and tear-reddened eyes, they guessed no doubt the reason why I came. Their looks were sullen, and their greeting cold. Nathless I spake. I come to tell you this. I am sixty, past. My wife is also old. Two helpless babes are left upon my hands, and from the garret where we starve, each stick of furniture is sold. We have no bread. A bed within a hospital, my corpse would be a prize for students to dissect, is for a beggar like myself enough. But for my wife and darlings, it is not. So for their sakes, I must return to work. But first... I crave your license for the act, lest slander's tongue should slaver over my name. Behold, my hair is white, my hands are black. I have toiled hard for more than forty years. Let me go back to earn our daily bread. I tried to beg. I could not. My old age is my excuse. The man upon whose brow the constant wielding of a hammer's weight has graved deep furrows, hard to be effaced, cuts a poor figure, when to pass us by, he holds for arms a hand that still is strong. With my two hands, I pray you, tis but fit that I, the oldest, should be first to yield. Let me go back again, alone, to work. You hear. Now tell me if you grant me leave. Then from the crowd of drinkers one advanced, three steps, and called me, Coward! to my face. My heart grew cold. Blood mounted to my eyes. I looked at him who spake the taunting word, a tall, slim stripling, pale beneath the gas, a shameless dancer at the Faubourg balls, with love-locks on his temples, like a girl. He grinned and mocked me with malicious eyes. The rest kept silence, silence so profound that I could hear the throbbing of my heart. I clasped my forehead in my hands and cried, my wife and darlings, then, it seems, must die. So be it, and I will not go to work. But thou, I swear, shalt answer for thy taunt, and we, like grander folks, will fight it out. My time? At once. My arms? I have the choice. The heaviest hammers best will serve our turn, light in our hands as any sword or pen, and you, my mates, must second each of us. Quick, form a ring, and search yon corners well, for two good iron sledges, red with rust. And thou, vile scorner of an old man, doff thy blouse and shirt, and spit upon thy hand. Foaming with rage, I elbowed through the crowd a path, and in a corner of the walls picked out two hammers from a clustered heap. Then, having weighed them at a the glance, I flung the heaviest tool at my insulter's feet. He still kept grinning, but he seized the shaft, armed at all hazards, standing on defence, and cried, Old fellow, don't be spiteful now. I deigned no answer, but drew near the wretch, and while I teased him with my honest eyes, in rapid circles round my head I whirled the trusty sledge, a deadly weapon now. Never had a cur that cowers beneath the lash within his haggard and imploring eyes so base a look of supplicating fear as that which I detected in the glance of the foul craven who recoiled aghast and propped his back against the filthy wall. Too late, alas, too late. A mist of blood, a crimson veil seemed drawn between my eyes, and that pale caitiff palsied with affright and with a single blow. I crushed his skull. I know it was murder, and I own my guilt. I want no advocate to fence with words, and foist the name of duel on a crime. Dead, at my feet, with oozing brains he lay, and as a man who on a sudden feels all the immensity of Cain's remorse, I stood there, shrouding both my eyes from view. At length some shuddering comrades sidled up, 
and would have seized me, but I shook them off, and cried, Let go! I doom myself to death! They understood. Then, taking off my cap, I passed it to them, like the bag in church. Tis for the wife and little ones, my friends. That brought ten francs, of which a chum took care, and then I went and gave myself in charge. Thus you have heard the plain, unvarnished tale of my great crime, and need not pay much heed to what the glib-tongued advocates may say. If I have dwelt on pitiful details, t'was but to prove what horrors may result from a foredoomed concurrence of events. My helpless babes are in the hospital, where sorrow killed my brave, long-suffering wife. Whatever my fate, the galleys or the jail, or even pardon, matters little now. And if you send me to the scaffold, thanks. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. When Children Sleep by Leon Gautier. Translated from the French by George Murray. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. When Children Sleep from the French of Leon Gautier. When cradled by their mother's side, the babes repose in slumber deep. Dream not they constantly abide on earth while seemingly asleep. Ah, no, at times the angels come and bear them in their arms away, far off to heaven, their fitting home, and teach the darlings how to play. And when the mother's loving eyes between the snowy curtains peep, to watch the baby as he lies at midnight wrapped in balmy sleep. The angels swiftly downward go to lay him in his dainty cot, and near the cradle whisper low, though the fond mother hears them not. And then the years in rapid flight like dreams of ecstasy pass by, and half those days of pure delight are spent by infants in the sky. But when, alas, Sin's lurid stain hath tarnished souls so white before. The children bound to earth remain. The angels visit them no more. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Thief A Christmas Story Translated from the French of Louis Frechette By George Murray Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. Twas a bleak winter. Numbers of the poor heard the wolf hunger howling at their door. The winds blew colder, and there was a dearth of Christmas logs on many a cheerless hearth. And the child Jesus, too, perchance would slight the small patched shoes laid out for the gifts at night. Christmas! The lamps illuminated every street. And on the pavements, crusted o'er with sleet, a busy multitude besieged the doors of countless tempting treasure-laden stores, where by deft hands arranged a gorgeous sight, wares of all colors shimmered in the light. Gay laughter floated round, the sparkling rhyme beneath each footfall almost seemed to chime, and all seemed bathed in opalescent dyes. There, for a moment, my inquiring eyes fell on a pale and feeble bodied lad, who strayed along and shivered thinly clad. His looks devoured the luminous display of gilded nothings which appear so gay before our hearts are cold and hard and dry. The frail street Arab seemed in ecstasy. I was myself engaged to buy some toys or graceful trifles that each child enjoys and each fond parent gives on such a day, when, all at once, I heard with some dismay cries of, Stop, thief! Police! Arrest the child! Then the inexorable crowd grew wild and seized the culprit. T'was the same poor lad whom I had seen, now more than doubly sad. Grabbed by a cop and panting hard for breath, by the horse shouting frightened half to death, while his numbed hand, unused to stealing, tried with awkward haste beneath his rags to hide a small, stiff doll, elaborately dressed. The thief was captured. By grave thoughts oppressed, I went my way. And when I reached my home, I kissed my children, 
but my heart would roam throughout the evening why i scarce can tell to the pale boy locked up within a cell when midnight came i left my bed in haste and in each shoe my stealthy tribute placed but still i saw his cough was harsh and loud a ragged child above a showcase bowed i saw him eagerly but ill at ease stretch his chilled hand the luring prize to seize i saw him ope his tatters that he might conceal his booty and then take to flight next the police the dock the jail and last the shame and sorrow on his parents cast an orphan maybe twas his first disgrace i felt keen pity for the poor child's case and thus although not loving the resort next day i entered the recorder's court between some tramps and women of the town the boy stood there with tearful eyes cast down his story short and sad his only friends were those the law reluctantly defends that disinherited and hopeless class who have no bread and nothing else alas but their brave spirit to support their fate three years before this last misfortune's date the orphan's sire struck headlong by a bale on board a harboured brig about to sail had fallen lifeless in the vessel's hold then his poor mother so the outcast told had toiled incessantly their food to get while he himself had tried to pay his debt tending his little sister well when e'er some outside labor claimed his mother's care soon came the sister's illness and in turn he struggled hard their livelihood to earn pitying his mother who with patience mild watched by the bedside of her dying child that fateful evening having seen her weep for christmas gifts that come when children sleep he left the house and begged alas in vain for some small present to console her pain it was for her your honour nigh to death i stole the doll he said with faltering breath tis the first time the lad of tender years then hid his face and bursting into tears sank down too weak his anguish to control and i went out with pity in my soul for the poor magistrates condemned at times to punish deeds their hearts reject as crimes End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Magic Bow by Charles Cros. Translated from the French by George Murray. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. The Magic Bow. Her hair was blond as autumn wheat, and downwards in a golden sheet it trailed until it touched her feet. In music strange she spake alway, like some sweet seraph or a fay, and fringed with black her eyes were grey. He deigned no rivalry to heed, when scoring hill and dale with speed, he bore her off upon his steed. She on all suitors in the land frowned with disdain, serenely grand, until he came and touched her hand. Her soul by love was so overborne that when he smiled with heartless scorn, she drooped, desponding and forlorn. And in a last caress she said, With my long hair I pray thee braid thy bow to charm some other maid. Wildly and long she kissed him ere she died, obedient to her prayer, his bow he braided with her hair. Then, like a blind man who, for pay, on his Cremona strings doth play, he woke a melancholy lay. And all with ecstasy were filled, for in each court the passion thrilled of the fond maid his scorn had killed. The king advanced his fortunes high, and the brown queen was lured to fly with him beneath the moonlit sky. But when he bade his music flow, to charm her ears, the fatal bow upbraided him with strains of woe. When the slow dirge no longer plained, they died, their goal still unattained, and the dead girl her hair regained. Her hair, that blond as autumn wheat, trailed downward in a golden sheet, 
until its tresses touched her feet. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Translation of the Abbe Pellegrin's Noel, seventeen o one, by George Murray. Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. Dear infant, tender, newborn child, how sweet to mortals is thy love! Averse to punish, thou art mild, as thy self-sacrifice will prove. The world hath hope in thee alone; tis for our sins thou dost atone to stay the wrath of god above o oh, how thy sense of what is just with rigor for thyself is armed it strikes thyself in whom we trust and serves thy god whom man hath harmed for though by clemency inspired thy heart with indignation fired seems by our sinfulness alarmed alas no frail created thing hails thee with reverential awe in thee we fail our own king, diviner than the world e'er saw. Thy father's self doth animate the human race to scorn and hate the very author of the law. The rudest season of the year doth chill thee with its wintry blast. Man for his master sheds no tear, regardless where his lot is cast. Against the saviour of the world the fury of the storm is hurled, prophetic of his death at last. And notwithstanding all thy might, In a rude cradle thou dost moan, And hast thy share of life and light, Predestined to the tomb alone, Alas, that death itself should seem Against its lord and king supreme To claim unprecedented right. It is too much, almighty God, And we, frail mortals in our turn, Ought, since thy hand hath spared the rod, For thee with answering love to yearn, Grant that thy flames of love divine may in our souls hereafter shine and through the countless ages burn. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Black Point by Gerard de Nerval. Translated from the French by George Murray. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. When to the sun a man hath raised his eye too long, thenceforth he sees persistently a floating livid spot. I for one moment madly bent my gaze, with youth's audacity, on glory's blaze, the blaze became a blot. Since then, on all things, melancholy, dark, I trace despairingly the spectral mark I strive in vain to shun. Must it forever on my life intrude? Alas, none other than the eagle's brood, unblinded face the sun. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Present Help in Trouble by George Murray. Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. Suggested by Charles Lamb's description of a picture in which is represented the legend of a poor female saint who having spun till past midnight to maintain a bedridden mother has fallen asleep from fatigue while angels are finishing her work in another part of the chamber an angel is tending a lily the emblem of purity the memory of a simple tale called up from childhood's years with blissful charm that cannot fail compelleth gentle tears yea though it be a poet's dream pure fantasy forsooth which cold clear reason ne'er can deem reality or truth still when we weep our spirits are oft sanctified by grief for childlike faith is lovelier far than manlike unbelief there is a legend of a maid told by the painter's art so sweet so sad it cannot fade for ever from my heart deeply my pity it doth stir e'en now with holy spell it needeth no interpreter that silent parable tis midnight darkness like a pall hangs o'er a sleeping city's wall many an iron tongue slave to man's more iron will calling through the air so still the self-same chimes hath rung 
and at that hour when every breast from life's life withering toil should rest there sitteth one within that city's heart cold heart of stone wearily spinning all alone a maid scarce touched by sin she toils within a cheerless room a rushlight twinkling through the gloom its dreariness to show poor pallid maid for whom this earth hath found no dowry since her birth save only want and woe her mother white as are the dead lies murmuring strangely on a bed as though with death at strife thin fingers clutch the dear-bought food bought at the price of flesh and blood a daughter's fragile life and still that maiden spins alone within that city's heart of stone and often turns her eye to watch the lamp of life decay well knowing that its last faint ray must soon in darkness die but hark she speaks tis sadly strange no rest from toil no sign of change save where my mother dies and she is dearer than all else to me i grow less earthly day by day why doth the angel death delay his summons that will set me free from pain and want and misery hunger and winter's cold at length have bowed my feeble body's strength the power is lacking now i feel that earned my mother's daily meal would god that from the viewless sky some pitying angel band might glide to earth and swiftly ply the labors of my hand would that but oh the thought is sin seraphs might stoop these threads to spin god knows how oft i vigils keep god knows alas i sleep i sleep the maiden's prayer was born to heaven its rude simplicity forgiven so were heard quick rushing pinions angel bands with gleaming feet floating down from god's dominions flew to aid that virgin sweet see they fill the lowly room shedding light where all was gloom see their hands perform the task as the maid presumed to ask toiling spinning they rejoice and lull the slumberer with their voice softly sleep o pious maiden dream enchanted lie sorely wast thou sorrow laden deeply didst thou sigh nursed by thee an aged mother near the gate of death fondly cherished by no other do her fleeting breath clad in robes of spotless beauty lilies of the field burdened by no stress of duty fragrant odor yield maiden clothed in humble raiment lily of earth's soil thou hast earned a heavenly payment by thy saintly toil cheeks made pale by ceaseless labor wear a sacred hue angels claim thee for a neighbor virgin pure and true forms made thin by cold and hunger grow more glorified age-bowed frames seem fairer younger when by suffering tried starving paupers as they languish are not all alone hearts deep stung by piercing anguish still a guardian own holy poor ones are not friendless he who dwells above calls them home to glory endless children of his love sleep then maiden god will hear thee when thou pourst prayer angels now are watching near thee warding off despair in the poem this recording is in the public domain the blind man by theophile gutier translated from french by george murray as haggard as an owl by day a blind man through the town doth stray while vaguely groping mid the keys a dreary flute his fingers tease his pipeth antiquated strains wherein scant melody remains and like a ghost with sightless eyes where his dog may lead him eyes for him the noonday hath no light for him the world is drowned in night he hears it roaring like the fall of plunging streams behind a wall. God knows what dark chimeras vain haunt the dim chambers of his brain, what fantasies inscrutable 
thought rights within his reason's cell. So oft, half crazed by want of sleep, some captive in a dungeon keep, with rusty nail obscurely scrawls, strange hieroglyphics on the walls. Still, who can tell? Perchance when death hath quenched life's taper with his breath, the blind man's soul, inured to gloom, shall see distinctly in the tomb. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A un passant by Victor Hugo, translated from the French by George Murray, read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. A un passant, traveller who at night along the echoing street with thine uneasy dog passes the companied after the burning day, why onward walkst thou yet? Where leadest thou so late the patient wearied steed? Night, fearest thou not? far from farmhouse gate the robber's warning whistle to his mate or those werewolves that near the highway roam heed not the horse's heels but stealthily creep and gain thy crupper with a sudden leap mingling thy black blood with their fangs white foam fear above all the wildfire's erring lamp that from the road may lure through marshes damp and as it oft had wound at nightfall grey dreaming of cottage warmth and sounds of mirth and the great logs of welcome on the hearth lead thee towards lights that ever flit away fear lest thou meet a death dance in the plain when howling demons whirl in storm and rain in walls accursed of god profaned with their rites the magic tower deserted seems by day hell knows its story when the night falls grey, fills its old windows with unholy lights. Thou lonely traveller, where away so fast, with thine uneasy dog, at night accompanied, after the burning day, when rest inviteth thee, where leadest thou so late, thy patient weary steed? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Chanson d'Autom by Paul Verlaine Translated from the French by George Murray Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter The autumn wind wails thin Like a sobbing violin Long and low How it thrills my heart with pain This monotonous refrain Sad and slow Passion pale I pant, alas, for the chiming hours that pass to their sleep, till the visions throng my head of the good glad days long dead, and I weep. But the wind so wild and fleet overbears my willing feet, and I go as the withered leaves that spin when the winter gusts begin to and fro. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Brook and the Ocean by Victor Hugo Translated from French by George Murray Read for LibriVox.org A brook from a headland was falling In drops to the terrible sea When Ocean, the grave of a sailor, cried, Weeper, what wouldst thou with me? My life is all tempest and terror, no limit I own but the sky. Thou weakling, my power is stupendous, what need of thy service have I? The brook said, O turbulent ocean, I noiselessly steal to thy brink, and bear thee, salt sea, what thou lackest, a drop of fresh water to drink. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Withered Nosegay by Louis Frichette Translated from the French by George Murray Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia A Withered Nosegay Translated in the original meter Here's a posy of poor faded flowers that I keep As jealously guarded as gems in a heap For in their dead relics the fragrance I find Of a hand 
that for me deigned the blossoms to bind. And when memory floats back on the stream of the past, and I think of the days too enchanting to last, on these roses that naught but time's hand shall profane, love's halo of gold will forever remain. Poor flowerets, how often the tears from my eyes, like dewdrops unheeded, have watered your dyes. Alas, your bright crimson can never return, but still in your leaves the dear past I discern. Sleep here on my heart, and my lips' latest breath shall touch you caressingly, even in death. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Butterfly by Victor Hugo Translated from the French by George Murray Read for LibriVox.org by Sandra Schmidt The Butterfly Translation from Victor Hugo When the gorgeous butterfly in the jubilee of spring Floats voluptuously by, borne on gold and purple wing Oft those damask wings are torn by the faithless rose's thorn so when life is fresh and gay, mortals with capricious joy flutter heedlessly away with their fairest flowers decoy. Soon, alas, their wings are torn by perfidious pleasure's thorn. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Death of Rolla by Alfred de Musset Translated from the French by George Murray. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. The Death of Rolla. Marie then, smiling, looked into the glass. There she saw Rolla, but so pale, alas, that she grew faint and paler still than he. Ha! Ah, she said, trembling, what doth trouble thee? Trouble, said Rolla, hast thou not heard tell that I am ruined utterly, ma belle? I came to see thee and to say good-bye. Men know that I am ruined. I must die. Didst lose at play? My ruin is complete, and all is over. Ask no further, sweet. Ruined, she cried, and like a statue gazed, downwards with eyes dilated and amazed. Ruined? Thou hast no mother then alive, no friends, no kin, no comrades that survive. And thou wilt kill thyself. Oh, wherefore die? The fond sweet gaze grew fonder in her eye. More she scarce dared to question, so she laid her lips to his and kissed him, half afraid. One thing, however, more I would be told, at length she said. Ah, me, I have no gold. Even when I have, my mother takes it all. But here's my necklace. True, it is but small. Still, it is gold, dear. Tell me, shall I go and sell it for thee? Nobody will know. And thou canst take the money for thy play. With a soft smile, grave Rolla turned away. Draining a small dark phial, no word he said, but kissed her necklace, bending down his head. She raised it tenderly. The man was dead. His soul departed in that one chaste kiss, and for a moment two had tasted bliss. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Giant by Victor Hugo Translated from the French by George Murray Read for LibriVox.org by Sandra Schmidt The Giant Translated from Victor Hugo Brave chiefs, in the land of the giants I was born. My ancestors leapt over the Rhine stream in scorn. I was only a babe when my mother, fond soul, used to bathe me each morn in the snows of the pole, while my father, whose shoulders ensured him respect, with three shaggy bearskins my cradle bedecked. My father, O oh chiefs, was astoundingly strong. Now, alas, he is weak, for his life has been long. His hair is like snow, and deep wrinkles appear on his brow, telling plainly his end draws near. When he wants a new staff, his frail steps to sustain, he can scarcely uproot a young oak from the plain. But I will replace him, I scoff at all fear, I am heir to his steel bow, his axe and his spear. 
I alone can succeed the old man at his death, who am able the poplars to bend with my breath, and can dangle my feet in the valley at will, while I carelessly sit on the top of a hill. I was merely a boy when I opened the road over the snow peaks that form winter's alpine abode. My head, like a mountain that vapour enshrouds, arrested the course of the galloping clouds, and often, uplifting my hands to the sky, I seized the proud eagles far sailing on high. I fought with the storm, and my breath as it streamed extinguished each flash of the lightning that gleamed, or, bent upon sport, I would eagerly chase the wallowing kings of Leviathan's race, while I troubled far more than the hurricane's blast the ocean that opened its plain as I passed. From my grasp, which was merciless, nothing could save the hawk in the sky or the shark in the wave. The bear, whose huge body my arms were thrown round, breathed his last in my grip without visible wound. And oft-times, while tracking wild beasts in the snow, I have crushed the white teeth of the lynx with a blow. These pastimes were only the frolics of youth, for manhood's ambition too trivial for sooth. War now is my passion. I gloat over the fears and curses of multitudes mingled with tears. I love the fierce soldiery, bounding in arms, who gladden my soul with their shouts and alarms. When the onset is glowing mid powder and blood, and the rage of the fight like a turbulent flood sweeps hurriedly onward the warrior and horse, I rise in my might, and directing its course, I fearlessly plunge in the ranks of the brave, like a seabird that swoops on the dark rolling wave. Like a reaper alone, mid the ripe waving corn, I stand, while the squadrons in battle are torn, when the roar of my voice is but heard to resound, their yells in the echoing thunder are drowned, and my hand, like some rigid, hard-knotted old oak, unarmed betters armour with death-dealing stroke. Stark naked I fight, for so dauntless I feel that I scorn the protection of iron or steel. I laugh at your warriors, and void of all fear, carry naught to the fray but my tough ashen spear. And this helmet, so tight that ten bulls, stout and strong, if well yoked together, might drag it along. No ladders I need when besieging a fort, to shiver the chains of a drawbridge is sport. Like a catapult formed of invincible brass, I crumble high towers in one ruinous mass, and I wrestle, as t'were, with the walls of a town, till its moats are filled up with the ramparts pulled down. But, warriors, the day will arrive when at length I must follow my victims, despoiled of my strength. O oh, leave not my corpse as a banquet for crows, let my sepulchre be the Alps' loftiest snows, that strangers who gaze on each far-soaring peak, what mountain my tomb is, may wandering seek. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Foray by Sully Prudhomme, translated from the French by George Murray, read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Foray from an elegy by Sully Prudhomme. Here lilacs wilt beneath the blast, and short-lived songbirds cease their lay. I dream of summers that will last. Foray. Here lips to velvet lips cling fast, but the shared rapture dies away. I dream of kisses that will last. Foray. Here mortals weep over friendships past, and fitful loves that had their day. I dream of unions that will last. Foray. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Golden Dream by George Murray. Read for LibriVox.org by Sandra Schmidt. The Golden Dream from the French. She sleeps. Her head is pillowed where, on the green turf, with blossoms fair, the hawthorn blows. Strange angel maid, for whom this earth has found no dowry from her birth, save only woes. 
but faintly on her youthful face a sunny smile we still may trace then lightly tread she sleeps tis well break not her golden vision spell it may be that some gentle strain whose tones the prisoned soul and chain bids her rejoice even while she sleeps she may hear fond love words murmured in her ear sweet memory's voice and then the poor deserted child seems loved and blessed by dreams beguiled o oh, lightly tread she sleeps tis well break not her golden vision spell alas that vision must be brief and her young heart's overwhelming grief will be more deep yet on each feature there is peace your woodland birds your warbling seas still let her sleep and pray we that our angel's care may love and guard that maiden fair o oh, lightly tread she sleeps tis well break not her golden vision spell end of poem this recording is in the public domain wither by morris rosenfeld translated from the yiddish or judeo german by george murray read for LibriVox.org by thomas peter these were the last verses that mr murray wrote january nineteen ten whither sweet orphan dost thou go the world is not open as yet you know day has not broken peace reigns around throughout the streets there is scarce a sound the flowers are still dreaming the birds are mute sleep clouds the eyes of each wearied brute whither my child art thou driven now what work so eager to do and how to earn scant food for my needs i trow why walking sweet girl so late at night the world is silent and void of light where art thou borne by the chilly breeze thy day has been luckless and thou wilt freeze the night is silent and deaf and blind then whither sweet girl with heedless mind hungry some food i am forced to find since god my father doth seem unkind end of poem this recording is in the public domain end of the poems of george murray edited by john reed